Okay. Um, can everybody hear me, see me, and see the slides? Yes, we do. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Um, my name is Philip Comento. Uh, uh, for the second year in a row, I am not talking to you from Zacatecas, Mexico, but from Vancouver, Canada. Um, so I've been a regular GNOME contributor for about eight years. I used to like tabs, now I like spaces. And you can probably also see on the slides that I like cat pictures. Um, at my day job, I work on JavaScript engines at Egalia. Uh, today I'll be talking about what's new with JavaScript in GNOME. This is the 2021 episode of a talk that's become somewhat of a tradition at Quadec. And I guess that means people must like JavaScript or something. Uh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so as every year, this talk is primarily aimed at people who write code for the GNOME platform in the JavaScript programming language. Whether that is in GNOME shell or apps or shell extensions or even command line scripts. GNOME has its own JavaScript engine, GJS, uh, which is an extended version of the JavaScript engine from the Firefox browser, also called SpiderMonkey. Uh, the first half of the talk is going to be about what's new with GJS in GNOME 40 and 41 and how it can benefit you in the code that you write. The second half, I'll talk about what improvements you can expect to see coming up in GNOME 42. And the third half is going to be about what we need help with and how you can get involved. Uh, sorry, I trained myself to advance the slides using the arrow keys, but they don't work on big blue buttons. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this presentation is also meant to be a resource that you can consult later. So I'll be running pretty quickly through things like the new uh, language features, because they're not Maybe really that interesting to add Oops, the link in the shared notes, Philip. So um, everybody can just copy the link and add it in the shared notes. Maybe so uh, others can follow. Then this may be uh, a, a solution. Yeah, you know what. I just realized I didn't upload this to this location after the presentation. So okay. you can you can uh, click this link uh, later when the presentation is done, and then you can click through the links. Oh. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so um, this link will start working after the presentation is over, uh, and then you can click on it. And if you're watching the presentation after the facts uh, on the recorded version, then it, it will work for you. And uh, you can follow the links. All right. <clears throat> so part one, what's new for GNOME 40 and the soon to be released GNOME 41? Crash fixes. And by the way, on these slides, I'll use these little circled 40 and 41 icons. Um, right here. Let me get the fancy pen tool. So I'll use these little circled 40 and 41 icons to show things that you can expect to see in Chrome 40 and 41. And I will take off my hat icon to the person who contributed it. <clears throat> so first of all, we fixed just as many crashing bugs as were reported in the past year. Uh, although that does mean that we have the same number as we started out with, but most of them are new. So we've cycled through them pretty quickly. Um, so Marco did several refactors for GNOME 40 that increased the type safety in the code base with C++ features. And I've done a few of those as well. They're not specifically crash fixes, but they do decrease the likelihood that there are yet undiscovered crashes lurking in the code base to ruin your programs. Uh, Marco also worked on a pair of pull requests, which should be ready to merge in time for GNOME 41. They don't not only increase type safety, but also reduce the amount of memory taken by introspected objects and functions. It's a savings of a few bytes per object, but when you have 10,000s of objects alive simultaneously in GNOME shell, it actually makes quite a difference. Uh, in GNOME 40, we got ES modules. Uh, this was a 
big change. Thanks to Evan for all the work on this. Um, ES stands for ECMAScript, which is the standardized version of JavaScript. The, the ES modules are called ECMAScript modules, as in they are the standardized module system for JavaScript, as opposed to the non-standard module systems that many environments had previously. Like we had imports in GJS, and for example, Node.js had require. Uh, so here's a before and after example of using the old non-standard module system uh, up here and he has those down here. In both systems, we have built-in modules, like system. Uh, in both systems, we have geobject introspection modules, like GTK. Uh, and in both systems, we have modules that consist of other JavaScript files from your program, like my module. <clears throat> but in ES modules, these are a bit more distinct from each other. Uh, and another advantage of ES modules is that when you import them, from a relative path, like we're doing here, you don't need to use some sort of hack to add the current file path to the module search path. Relative paths are always resolved relative to the path of the current file, even if that file is in a G resource. Um, so if you want to port your GGS program to use ES modules, run it with the dash M command line flag, or if you have a C executable for your app that embeds the GGS, then start your JavaScript with GJS context eval module instead of GJS context eval. Uh, the reason you have to do this is because ES modules are technically different type of JavaScript source uh, in which import and export statements are legal. They're not legal in normal sources. So for that reason, ES modules can use the old style imports object to import legacy modules, but legacy modules can't import ES modules with import statements because imports are not legal in non-module sources. So you could still use dynamic imports. But that's kind of inconvenient if you're uh, trying to convert your program. So if you want to port your code from legacy modules to S modules, then start at the top level, start in your main file that imports other files, and work downwards. Um, so what I will say is that the legacy module system is not going away for sure. I would encourage new code to use ES modules and we're not going to make any enhancements to the legacy module system in the future, but there's too much existing code that relies on it for it to go away. I expect there's going to be a pretty long transition period before most GJS code is fully ported to ES modules, and I'll talk a bit about this in the next slide. Uh, in particular, I'd point out that porting is going to be a minor pain for shell extensions, because they won't be able to port until GNOME Shell starts supporting ES module extensions. Uh, it should be possible to allow ES module and non-ES module extensions to exist side by side in GNOME Shell, but we'll need to take care in order to allow extensions to define whether they should be imported as an ES module or a legacy module. All right. Uh, here are the ways that ES modules might not be straightforward to port from non-module source code. <clears throat> ES modules, uh, they're always automatically in strict mode. Uh, so strict mode is uh, a kind of subset of JavaScript syntax that you can opt into that uh, avoids a lot of common mistakes. Browsers invented it a long time ago. Um, so uh, by using an ES module, your code automatically goes into strict mode. So if you had anything that didn't work in strict mode before, there might be some incompatibilities there. Uh, however, a lot of the strict mode errors are already caught and discouraged by linters. So if you're using one, you probably don't have to worry so much. Uh, the, and, you know, for, for example, uh, the bodies of classes are also automatically in strict mode. Um, and I'm not aware of much breakage that occurred uh, due to that when people generally switch to starting to use classes. Um, but the one instance during the class switch that I did personally see was kind of obscure. So this is something to keep in the back of your mind if you start using ES modules and you see some obscure error. Uh, the other thing that you may have to take care to do differently when you port your code is conditional imports. Uh, there's an example here. Um, so unlike the Lean module system, uh, in ES modules, when you resolve an import, it happens at compile time, not run time. So import statements are only legal at the top level of the file, not inside an if clause, for example. Uh, so if you need to import something conditionally, 
use the dynamic import function. Uh, this function is asynchronous, so it returns a promise, and you need to await it. And that means that you, if you use conditional imports, you will have to refactor your code somewhat. All right, next major improvement in GNOME 4 on my list to talk about is the work of NASA, GGS's outreach intern from the December 2020 round. Uh, and I encourage you to look for her lightning talk in the intern lightning talk session on Friday at 1500 hours UTC. Uh, so what we've gotten is several improvements to make the debugger more useful for debugging. The original debugger was quite basic. It had a backtrace command, of course, but now it has a backtrace full option, just like GDB. Uh, and that prints all the information about the local variables in the stack frame. Uh, and the debugger also now has access to the source code of the programming program that it's debugging. Um, so there is actually now a list command that also works like GDB. And when you show a frame, uh, either the one you're on or a different frame, it also shows the line of source code that goes along with it. So let me show you a quick example of what this looks like. Uh, here's a sample program to debug, and here's a demonstration. Oh, I didn't miss the slide. So here's the sample program to debug, uh, and here's the demonstration of the uh, the new features. So uh, for the, the backtrace, we do a backtrace full, and you can see the value of the local variable d. Um, and we see a demonstration of the list command. And so the program listing can even highlight the current line, uh, depending on the value of an option that NASA also added. But that's not visible here, because I couldn't get it to highlight in this plain text markdown block. Um, but you can highlight the current line. Uh, and then here, if you're displaying a frame, you also see the source line corresponding to that frame. So next, I'll talk about JavaScript object d object parameters. Uh, now, I know that's too many objects in one sentence. So what it means is on your g object classes, you can now define properties that take a JavaScript object as their value. That was previously not possible. Uh, and Similarly, you can also have g-object signals that take a JavaScript object as one of their parameters or their return value. Uh, this is probably most going to be used for uh, having a g-object property with the value of a JavaScript array, which is something I've wanted to do a few times. It's a bit tricky to define arrays within the g-object type system. Uh, but there are other JavaScript built-in objects that might be useful as property values like date or map or set etc. Uh, so thanks to Marco for doing this. Um, something I hope will be coming up in GNOME 41 is the text encoder and text decoder API. This is another initiative from Evan. Uh, so text encoder and text decoder is technically a web API, not JavaScript, but Node.js has it as well. Uh, so it's good for us to have this too, because it's a more standardized way to convert between strings and bytes. And this is actually the reason that the new ES module system didn't include a byte array module like the old module system did, because uh, you know, the idea that Evan had was to not perpetuate the old way into the new module system and use the more standard way in the new module system. Uh, so here's some before and after code, um, <clears throat> encoding and decoding a pizza to uh, UTF-8. Uh, if you still want to use the old byte array module, you can, but you won't be able to import it as an ES module. So you'll have to use imports.byte array. All right. Next up, one of the things that I did during this cycle is a step towards removing the big hammer. And I'm sure people are curious about that. There will be more coming about that later in the presentation. Uh, so this here is a screenshot from Sysprof that I took with a demonstration app that intentionally creates a lot of garbage very quickly. And it, the app includes a button to trigger a garbage collection. Uh, so you can see a bunch of counters here. These are all new. Um, so like, you know, the number of signal handlers and the number of G objects. Uh, so there are about a, a dozen of these counters now. You can show or hide them individually in sysprof. I just picked a few to show for this example. Um, and the bottom two down here, GC bytes and malloc bytes, uh, they show some statistics from the JavaScript engine itself. Uh, how many bytes are used in garbage collectible memory? 
and how many bytes allocated by malloc are owned by those garbage collectible things. Um, so the number for the malloc bytes, that's a bit underreported right now. It doesn't, it's not, it's too low because the JavaScript engine doesn't know about all of our memory allocations in GObject. So I'll talk more about how we're going to fix this later. Uh, then down below here, um, previously you could see timings for garbage collections, uh, but you can see now that these timing statistics have been improved. Uh, and they, the, what's really interesting is they now include information on why the garbage collection occurred. So for this first one, you can see the reason is API, which means that you know, somebody called system.gc, which in practical terms, it means that in this demonstration app, I click the button that calls that API. And then you can see at the 10 second mark here, there's this, uh, well, I'm not drawing a very straight line, but uh, at the 10 second mark, there's this other garbage collection. Uh, the reason is given as big hammer hit and that, you know, because it occurs every 10 seconds. And so on. You know, here's another garbage collection where I click the button. Um, so yeah, uh, and another project from Evan is to provide an implementation of the console uh, object. Uh, so like, it, just like text encoder, this is another web API which is also implemented by Node.js, and it can be useful for us for sharing code. Um, most people who have developed JavaScript in a browser know console.log um, like in this example, but you know, there are a bunch of other functions in the console namespace as well that could be useful. So with a bit of luck, we could land this for GNOME 41. Um, and then finally, I want to give a special shout out to the extensions rebooted initiative with, and you know, apart from they've been mentioned, uh, earlier today for all the good work they've been doing. Apart from all that, uh, you know, that's really important for the GNOME desktop and, uh, you know, getting people, um, you know, people who write extensions more integrated in the community. They've also been gradually improving the documentation of GJS as they notice pe things that people run into when they're writing extensions. Uh, so special shout out. Uh, so that was a selection of some of the exciting new things that we either have already in GNOME 40 or we'll get soon in GNOME 41. Um, now on for part two, what are the exciting things that we should be able to see in the upcoming year in GNOME 42 or possibly 43? Uh, first off, I'd like to talk about the work of Vina, GGS's outreach intern from the May 2021 round. Uh, she'll also be giving a lightning talk about this, so if you want to know more, here's another reminder to go see the intern lightning talk session on Friday at 1500 hours UTC. <clears throat> so Vina's working on adding annotations to G-Object introspection, such as finish funk and sync funk, like we see in this example here. Um, th these are going to allow us to tie together these pairs of functions, the async function and the finish function, and then the synchronous version we need to tie those together automatically. Um, so previously we had to tie these together manually with GIO.promiseify in order to use async style programming. Uh, and in the future, we'll be able to leave out the Promiseify, uh, just like it shows here in the commented out code. Um, and you know, I also want to shout out Promiseify uh, was the work of Avi, a previous outreach intern from 2018. And I'm ex really excited that, uh, that someone's continuing it now. So these annotations are getting near to being ready in G-Object introspection. I think we'll land them for GNOME 41 probably. Um, the corresponding changes in GJS are a stretch goal for the internship. So those may happen for GNOME 41 or they may happen later. Um, Evan's been working on upgrading the JavaScript engine to the next long-term support release from Firefox. Uh, so luckily, uh, you, you might have remembered some painful upgrades from the past. Luckily, there don't seem to be any backwards incompatibilities that you have to remove from your code this time, at least that we know of yet. Uh, and I'll talk about the cool things that it does bring us. Uh, so one thing you'll see on this slide that we get is private class fields. Uh, if you have a JavaScript class, you can now have truly encapsulated fields that cannot be accessed from outside the class. Uh, and 
one thing to note is just like the public class fields that we already got a year ago, this does not yet integrate well with G-Object classes, and we're hoping to solve this in a future release. Um, we're going to get the at method for arrays and strings. This lets you do nicer indexing, kind of Python style, where you can pass minus one to get the last item and minus two to get the second to last item and so forth. So uh, you don't have to calculate the length, like uh, in this example down here, and you know, risk off by one errors. Uh, where you accidentally uh, forget the minus one or something. Makes things a lot simpler. Um, last year with the upgrade we got promise.all. Uh, that's a function that returns a promise that waits until all of its sub-promises have resolved. And now with this upgrade we'll also get promise.any, uh, which is kind of the opposite of that. Uh, it waits for any one of the sub-promises to succeed and then it resolves with that promises value and it ignores the resolutions of the remaining promises. So I, that sounds kind of complicated, so I, I put a little example. I hope that'll make it clearer. Um, so this sample code, it sends requests to two servers, east and west, and it resolves the promise with whichever server responds faster. But if neither server, neither server, tongue twister, if neither server responds within 30 seconds, then it'll give up. Uh, so this is different from promise.race, which is another uh, API that we got in the previous upgrade. Um, so with race, the promise resolves with the first sub-promise's resolution, even if that's a failure. So it wouldn't be correct to use promise.race here, uh, because if check server east was offline and it returned an error quickly, then we get that error as the result of the promise, uh, even if west was still online, and it would just ignore the result from west. So. Um, Promise.any is, uh, is good for certain patterns of asynchronous programming. Um, we also get a bunch of new operators. Uh, these operators can be used to assign default values to a variable. Uh, and they short circuit. So uh, the right hand side of the expression B is not evaluated if the left-hand side already determines that the assignment doesn't take place. So for example, with the question, question equals operator, um, if you, you, know, you have a variable A, uh, and if A is null or undefined, then A will get the value of B. If A already has a value that's not undefined, then it'll stay the same. And if B has any side effects, then it won't be evaluated if A already has a value that's not null or undefined. Um, so, you know, after the talk, click through the documentation if you're curious. Uh, so it's time for part three. Uh, if you want more exciting stuff to happen, here's how we could use your help. Um, so one thing, uh, people who write an app or an extension for the first time often copy code in order to get started quickly. Uh, you know, they copy it and modify it. Uh, this is a perfectly normal thing to do. It's part of what free software is all about. You know, one of the freedoms is the freedom to study the software. Uh, so we should have good code that uses good practices available, available for people to learn from. Um, so one thing, I've made some improvements recently updating the GJS sample app. Uh, since some outreach applicants were running into problems with it this year because it was kind of outdated. Uh, and for my talk at the Linux Application Summit earlier this year, I made a, a bit more complicated sample app that integrates some tools from the Node.js ecosystem that people might be familiar with, just kind of to see if it was possible. Um, so we could use some help, uh, you know, figuring out whether some of these should become best practices and integrating it into our documentation. Um, and you know, for other people to try out these sample apps. Uh, Evan's also exploring the integration between GJS and TypeScript, and he's planning a birds of a feather session on this topic on Friday at 1610 hours UTC. Um, so if you started using GJS and you find something that's confusing or you think it's a bad example, um, come talk to us in the matrix channel. Oh, <laughs> I really can't draw good lines with the mouse. Uh, so the thing, the thing that you're asking about, it, it may or may not be um, a mistake or a bug, uh, but usually, at least when you know when we talk to people who are confused about something, there's at least a good answer to the question of 
where would have been a good place for you to find this information? And that will move things forward for the next person to have the same question. They might be able to find it a bit better. Um, right. So finally, I'll talk about the big hammer. Uh, and the big hammer, you may have guessed, has not yet been removed. Uh, so I've talked about this at the two previous squad X, so I will go over it yet again. If you're curious about the details, check out my talk from Guadec 2019. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, so, you know, the big hammer, uh, I talked about it in the memory profiling slide earlier. It runs a garbage collection every 10 seconds uh, because some objects don't get cleaned up. Um, we know pretty much how to solve it. Uh, at this point, we have almost run out of well-defined problems. Uh, so the only well-defined problem remaining is to implement better accounting of memory associated with objects. Uh, so that the, you know, the malloc bytes that I was talking about in the statistics, they correspond better to the actual size of allocated G objects that we have. This will give us the more accurate numbers and sysprofs that I was talking about earlier. Um, and also help us better figure out, uh, you know, how to quantify memory usage for GNOME shell. Uh, so hopefully this will land in GNOME 42, but if someone would like to fix it earlier than I get around to it, that would be really welcome. And there's also a glib bug blocking it, which would be great to have help with. Uh, but after that's done, there are only squishy demotivating problems left to solve, where it's not clear what success looks like, and this is what we most need help with. So if we just enable the fix that we have and remove the big hammer, uh, then it's going to look like the memory usage of GNOME Shell will go up drastically, and it'll be a public relations disaster with all sorts of articles published about how we have huge memory leaks. Um, but, you know, the thing is, the cause won't be a memory leak. It's just that we are not going to be running the garbage collector every 10 seconds anymore. So more, more garbage will accumulate, and the memory usage is going to go up. And, you know, it won't go up as high as it was before the big hammer. So that's kind of the point. We don't actually want to keep collecting garbage every few seconds to keep the level down low. We want to find an acceptable level of memory usage. What we want is to figure out the right trade-off for both GNOME Shell and for apps that use GJS and figure out how to set the expectations for users who have been awaiting this fix for a long time. So can you help collect data on this or can you help communicate it? Please let me know. Um, so we're getting to the end. Uh, on that note, I'd like to end by acknowledging and thanking everyone who helped in any way with DJS in GNOME 40 and 41. Uh, and here's the license for this talk. You may reuse bits of this presentation as is with attribution and not for commercial use. Uh, and now it's time for questions. And uh, you know, I, for the shady JavaScript cat that appears in my presentation every year, uh, here's a picture of uh, the shady JavaScript cat feeling tired of solving squishy, unsatisfying problems. Um, so yes. I'll open the shared notes. So do um, you want to do this on your own, Philip? Oh, would you like to read the questions out? Oh, I can do this uh, if you want, but if you can, if you want to do it on your own, uh, I'm fine as well. Um, yeah, why don't you read the questions and then I can concentrate on answering them. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, good. Um, the first question is, when the full stack trace be available via API? the west uh, yeah ah okay um i don't know if the questioner uh was talking about the stack traces for promises or um or the debugger this is a good question maybe the questioner can oh, okay debugger ah debugger um yeah uh, I don't actually know the answer to this question. Um, I think uh, what you'll probably find out if you try to debug promises in the debugger is that the support for starting and stopping async operations is, uh, um, there's not really a good way to do that. So um, I am pretty sure that it's possible to get the uh, Wait. So yeah, I'm I'm not sure if I'm answering the right question. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, maybe we can move on to another one and whoever's yeah, yeah, question that was. Sure, sure. uh, <laughs> um, then sure. we can return to that. <laughs> okay. Um, and the second question is, will uh, G-object libraries have to specify their own annotations for the async support themselves? Um, I'll give a short answer. Uh, and uh, you know, don't want to spoil everything for Vina's uh, lightning talk on uh, tomorrow. Um, but the answer is, in most cases, no. Okay, <laughs> the next question is, uh, does the new async support, async support support odd cases like GDK sh show UI full GDK show UI finish? Um, this is another thing that I will encourage you to attend the intern lightning talks, uh, but it's, um, yeah, so there's going to be support for most cases. For very odd cases, you might have to specify it yourself in the in the doc string or the doc comments. Okay, and uh, the last question is: Is there any more information on the big hammer? Um, there is. I would uh, recommend watching the talk that I gave in. Uh, 2019 aquatic um, and if you don't like watching talks which I completely sympathize with uh, I also wrote uh, a blog post about it uh, which I can into the chat here when I'm done answering questions yeah so I don't know if you we want to come back to the first question <laughs> Uh, okay, I see uh, the yeah. questioner is written. Oh, oh, do we have the questioner on? Yeah, maybe okay, the questioner I... can also um, can, um, be active and uh, enable the microphone if maybe it's easier. Okay, but I'm looking at the thing here. It says, oh, I think not. Mm -hmm. oh, I, didn't, I didn't answer the right question. <laughs> I didn't mean about promises. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I got it. Uh, oh, okay. So the question is, if you call the GJS dump stack API, will you get the full stack trace with locals? Um, unfortunately, maybe not. It's a debugger only thing because the API stack trace, um, it uh, like it can occur from, it, it has to be thread safe. So it can't access anything from the JavaScript engine. It's just, uh, um, pulling the names of the stack frames. Uh, so you can't evaluate any variables or something. Um, so this is a debugger only thing, unfortunately. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we have a few minutes left. So I don't know if anybody w else want to a ask some more questions. There would be the chance to do this and write them down in the shared notes. Yes, somebody. Uh, what's the coolest long term yes. feature coming for us? Uh, <laughs> Coolest, really long term feature coming. <laughs> um, I could have a couple of uh, couple of answers. Um, I'm really excited about some of the things that are coming, um, you know, down the standardization pipeline in JavaScript. So it's kind of cheating since those are not features that that uh, you know that that we are programming ourselves. We just get them from Firefox. Uh, but I'm really excited about decorators, for example, um, and uh, I'm pretty excited about temporal, uh, which is um, you know replacing that horrible old uh, JavaScript date objects. And that's something that I'm actually working on at my work. 
Uh, so I'll be very excited to integrate that in GJS. Uh, the, the coolest feature that um, you know that is really something from for GNOME that we're not you know just sort of inheriting from Firefox. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I will be. Um, yeah, I'll be excited. I, like one thing that. Uh, that I'm really trying to do a lot on is uh, to automate a lot of the maintainer tasks for GJS. So I know this is maybe not so exciting for people who are, uh, you know, looking for improvements for code that they're writing. But um, I'm I'm certainly excited excited to uh, have more automated tools um, that you know guide people to uh, you know getting their code into GJS and having more contributors. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that you're doing this. Um, okay, uh, how hard is it to work with Spider Monkey, and do you, do you see a cha a change in engine in a not so near f future? There's a link uh, on ah, GitHub. Um, uh, I see. As so examples, yeah. Uh, I have actually, yeah, I've okay. actually really enjoyed. Working with Spider Monkey, um, I think uh, recently, um, you know, they Mozilla's made a lot of uh, you know a lot of good improvements in um, you know sort of gathering information about the people who embed Spider Monkey. It's not just GNOME, it's a bunch of other uh, software, both uh, both free and proprietary. Um, so they, they've, uh, they've done what I think is a really good job of engaging more with that community. Um, and, uh, you know, we've started this uh, Spider Monkey embedding examples that have been pasted here. Um, and uh, you know it's uh, so there's been a lot of improvements. Um, they've kind of asked people what are their you know what are their main pain points for working with embedded Spider Monkey, and you know for us the biggest one is that there's no official releases of Spider Monkey. Um, you just have to sort of go into their uh, you go into their continuous delivery system and you download the package. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really not so good release process. Um, so, you know, they've they've known about this for a long time, and that it's a, that it's uh, difficult for us. Um, I think the problem is, you know, for them to uh, try and find the you know the necessary priority to make the changes to their infrastructure to uh, allow official releases again. Um, and do I see a change in engine in a not so near future? Uh, I don't. Um, I think if we were to use a different engine, that would be a different project. And in fact, there are actually, like, you know, for there, so there are, um, there are, you know, there are the big three engines there's Spider Monkey, JavaScript Core, and V8. Um, you know, we have uh, actually another GNOME project that. Um, that embeds JavaScript core uh, in a in a interpreter that provides access to G objects, and there is another project being developed called Node GIR or something like that. Um, and so, you know, I think it's good uh, for these to exist. Um, oh, somebody's writing Node GTK is what it's called. So I think it's good for these to exist and. Uh, I, yeah, it's, you know, all three of these uh, big three JavaScript engines are, um, you know, they are developed uh, by entities that are not GNOME. So there's always a risk uh, that they might stop being developed or something. Um, it's pretty unlikely, I'd say. but. So you know, it's good that we have these other projects so that we could switch if we needed to, or if um, you know one of them made a 
change that made it really difficult to embed or something. I, I think that's quite unlikely as well. So don't take this as a prediction of something that might happen. Um, but I'm just saying I think it's good to explore these things. Um, and it's good for GGS to have a very comprehensive test suite uh, so that we could uh, switch if we needed to and figure out where changes would need to be made to keep supporting all the existing code. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen in the near future. So, sorry, um, and that's the last question. Uh, what is Spider Monkey and how is it used? There's a written an explanation, short explanation, but maybe you want to say something more. Yeah, um, I'd say this explanation is exactly correct. <laughs> it's the, uh, the JavaScript engine that runs all of the JavaScript in every website that you visit. It's Firefox. Um, and um, yeah. yeah, actually, they have a website now. I think that's new in the past year. So uh, you can go to spidermonkey.dev and find out more information. Hey, I guess there's no more qu uh, questions left. I will check again. No comments. Yes. So, like the cat, cat smooth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, thanks Philip, for your great 2021 talk here. And thank you for your attention. And see you all. And for the people who want to join the social event today on track one on in 11.40 p.m. is the cooking event. So have fun. Thanks, Philip. Thank you.